Selamat malam semua yang telah hadir di sini. Terima kasih atas waktunya. Nama saya David Utama. Uh, saya di sini akan berperan sebagai moderator. Tapi kalau yang baru uh, baru datang sekedar untuk uh, menjelaskan menerangkan bahwa Encounter ini tujuannya sebagai forum diskusi berbagi tentang pembelajaran studio gitu ya. Jadi dari mana saja ya memang harapannya bisa jadi alat refleksi juga mungkin ya ekspos wawasan ya yang bisa kemudian entah mau dijadikan alat uh, sebagai alat uh, studi banding, alat referensi atau evaluasi ya itu silakan dikembalikan ke masing-masing. Tapi tentu harapannya apapun yang kita lihat kita belajar di sini bisa berguna lah kita kita bisa bawa nanti gitu ya ke depan. Mungkin itu aja pembuka dari saya. Terima kasih semua buat hadir. Mungkin kita mulai lagi dengan uh, Diana. Silakan Diana. Oke, okay, selamat malam semuanya. Nama saya Diana. Um, hari ini akan berbicara tentang tiga topik. Pertama, short intro aja. Lalu, um, overall, uh, curriculum at RISE. Uh, kemarin pada hari sempat uh, bilang, mungkin um, apa ya, perbedaan antara four-year and five-year. Curriculum, so RISE is a five-year program. Um, and you know, I'll highlight more about that. Lalu, um, saya um, akan membandingkan um, perbedaan antara first year sama last year studio. Jadi, Um, first year sangat abstrak lalu last year um, lebih kompleks gitu. Um, Oke, okay. uh, quick intro saya dulu di RISE dari tahun 2006 sampai 2012. It's a five year program but there's a it's, a, it's technically a six year program and I'll get into that a bit later. Um, terus bahan-bahan ini kebanyakan dari tahun itu jadi mungkin sekarang kalau visualisasi lebih advance. Um, lalu saya melanjutkan di MIT Urban Design tahun 2016 sampai 2018. Um, sebelumnya pernah kerja di Pabu Dilin, sama internship uh, dan lain-lain. Lalu um, agak lama di OMA di Hong Kong, kerja dengan Daliana beberapa proyek kolaborasi. Uh, setelah itu saya menjadi in-house arsitek di WeWork dan sekarang ini sebuah real estate startup. Um, ya kira-kira itu konteksnya. Langsung aja mulai. Um, jadi RISE adalah program yang lumayan kecil, setiap uh, tahun um, kurikulum baru kita uh, foto rame-rame di satu ruang juri dan inilah semua populasi RISE School of Architecture. Um, general overview-nya uh, merupakan bagian dari RISE University di Texas. Um, it's the smallest professional degree program in the US, jadi biasanya mungkin antara 50 Uh, ke 100 murid, uh, we have 25 students per year. Um, the advantage is it's a, a very good student to faculty ratio. Jadi um, kita sangat mengenal profesornya selama lima tahun itu. Um, uh, dan da dari Houston um, banyak orang um, apa ya, mungkin murid-muridnya dari state lain dari negara lain lalu setelah sekolah um, work in our space, berarti arsitek, tapi juga um, uh, kami nggak 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 semua stay di arsitektur, um, banyak yang kerja buat magazines, museums, consulting firms, um, web designer, uh, urban planning, dan ada juga yang masuk ke law firm buat arsitektur. Um, ya, ini kira-kira seperti itu fasilitasnya. Lalu um, it's it's called, it's a five year program and we call it a four plus one. Jadi um, Empat tahun pertama, it's a liberal arts degree. Uh, you can finish your study in four years and not continue to fifth year. Maybe what orang-orang yang merasa architecture is not finally their right path, mereka mau ke program lain, they can stop at fourth year. But most people um, stay for fifth year. So um, di tahun keempat, if you, if you decide to continue to fifth year, then you technically have to apply. Uh, biasa kalau GPA cukup bagus dan uh, studio professor says give, give the green light, you are good to go. And then you get to participate in this uh, preceptorship year, yaitu program magang. Jadi um, uh, satu tahun, uh, it's a paid work. And that's a very highlight of my undergrad program. Um, so secara garis besar, tahun pertama sampai keempat, um, bedanya empat tahun, ini apa ya, gimana you know, kalau five year program biasa the first four years itu very studio focused. Um, jadi 
kurikulum uh, dibagi dengan desain studio, history theory, teknologi, dan sepertiga of the rest of the credits you get it from the university, yaitu electives, misalnya um, history, general history, art history, physics, um, kalau mau ambil class chemistry boleh, um, so basically electives other than architecture core program. Lalu di tahun ke lima, yaitu preceptor, preceptorship year, kita harus uh, menulis nih essay gitu. Um, jadi pertama, setiap tahun dirilis um, what's the options for all the offices that you can work at. Uh, jadi biasa kalau ada 25 student, ada 25 offices juga. Uh, lalu kita harus apply gitu. Apply-nya ke direktur program kita, bukan apply ke kantor ini. Jadi kantor-kantor yang udah decide to participate in this preceptorship program, they don't get to pick the students. Um, jadi kayak ya udah uh, trust aja the students juga will be good. Uh, so we have to write why we want to work at these particular firms, and then you know you get your, you usually get your top three choices lah gitu. Lalu di tahun kelima setelah kerja setahun balik lagi um, tahun kelima sangat lulus jadi ada dua required studio dan sisanya adalah elective. And this was fun soalnya um, usually by fifth year kita udah tahu spesifiknya interestnya ke apa jadi bisa ngambil elektif yang lebih cocok dengan interest kita masing-masing. Uh, lalu saya akan very quick overview aja studio projects um, dari tahun pertama ke lima gitu ya kira-kira. Setelah ini saya akan deep dive into the first and last semester. Oke, okay. jadi uh, first year um, ini kayak I think uh, I came to school. Uh, most people went to architecture with a preconceived uh, thought of apa sih arsitektur itu. So I thought first year ini lumayan menarik karena sangat abstrak. Nggak ada arsitekturnya sampai the last project gitu. So it was, uh, you know, kayak playing with colors, um, furniture, toy, um, dan baru akhir-akhirnya kita belajar case study houses gitu. Um, lalu tahun kedua mulai masuk ke um, building components dan representation yang lebih kompleks misalnya um, aksonomatis secara detail um, bikin market berskala besar dan programnya mulai uh, lebih kompleks juga yaitu movie theater dan ini intermodal train station di tahun ketiga kita belajar sistem jadi uh, develop sebuah sistem lalu di deploy di skala uh, rumah habis itu uh, perumahan yang lebih besar lagi jadi gimana kita membawa konsistensi dari sistem yang kita udah establish on the first place lalu mulai tahun ketiga dan seterusnya semester dua itu selalu option studio jadi akan ada dua pilihan biasanya um, sesuai interest kita dan di tahun ketiga ini um, Waktu itu hand drawing ya, jadi pakai meja gambar, using the traditional yang ada kayak apa ya, steel wire-nya di samping kanan kiri gitu, uh, dan belajar shading dan lain-lain. Um, ini studio lebih praktikal yang saya pilih, tahun ketiga semester dua. Lalu tahun keempat, um, yang sebelah kiri semester pertama, um, sama juga, jadi satu bangunan, serta setiap murid mendesain sendiri dari awal sampai akhir, kita ke site, dokumentasi, bikin market rame-rame, lalu um, ya presentasi gitu ya. Um, terus tahun keempat, semester kedua, ini option studio. Um, ya ini cukup menarik, waktu itu sama Eva Frank Gilbert, um, site-nya um, satu, setiap murid mendapatkan satu per dua belas dari uh, dunia gitu, dari peta dunia, lalu kita harus research gitu ya. Jadi, Um, yang ini proyek teman saya, um, dia research tentang, dia dapatnya Pacific Ocean, jadi bingung kalau di Pacific Ocean bikin proyek di mana gitu. Uh, tapi she found um, ini apa, the garbage um, collection dari uh, waves of the ocean, habis itu gimana in the future this can be architecturalized into a monument, dan sesuatu yang produktif gitu. Jadi studio ini uh, sangat abstrak, nggak ada, ada kayak, eh, gimana ya kayak struktur ini bisa berdiri gitu. Tapi it was a very, um, Intellectually Stimulating Studio. Uh, lalu di tahun kelima, semester pertama kita ada opsi boleh um, semester up di Paris. Dan proyeknya juga site-nya di Paris. Jadinya, uh, jadi tahun pertama sampai keempat, 
banyak kan based in Houston uh, dan realistik uh, ta- terus uh, akhir-akhirnya kita lebih kompleks dan internasional gitu ya jadi um, yang sebelah kiri ini saya di Paris dan um, lumayan waktu itu lumayan menarik sih karena bisa mempelajari sejarah dan gimana cara kita incorporate all the you know konteks yang tadinya proyek kebanyakan di Houston gitu terus tiba-tiba kita dibawa ke sesuatu yang historically very rich in Europe gitu lalu di sebelah kanan ada studio terakhir um, yaitu di Hong Kong um, ini studio urban design um, satu-satunya studio urban design di undergrad program uh, dan ini menarik juga struktur studionya sebelas uh, murid mendesain satu master plan uh, jadi nanti saya akan deep dive into gimana sih kayak how was the story in that studio gitu um, gitu ya kira-kira satu sampai lima I think my take away from my five years gitu karena dulu um, sekolahnya di Indo juga um, SMP dan SMA Uh, pertama kali gitu harus present a lot in front of people terus nggak nggak boleh menghafalkan kita uh, kurikulumnya diemphasize dengan understanding case study lalu gimana aplikasi apa yang kita pelajari dari case study ini ke proyek jadi I think it was quite interesting konteks gitu um, lalu saya mau kasih lihat beberapa elective aja waktu um, jadi di luar core studio beberapa elektif yang uh, memorable gitu ya. Yang pertama um, namanya The Joy of Materials. Jadi di studio di kelas ini kita belajar tentang material misalnya kayu atau batu gitu. Terus ada bacaan-bacaannya. Kalau batu mungkin uh, Peter Zumthor atau apa gitu kan. Jadi baca essay habis itu kita um, ada field trip juga. Uh, dan ini field trip kita ke Luikan um, Project by Louis Kahn, it's a Kimball Museum in, in Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, and that was quite memorable. Jadi, um, ya, yeah, sampai sekarang kayak masih stick in my head sih. Uh, how different materials to, uh, how the same material can have different textures and visibility and character gitu, under different lights and uh, finishes gitu ya. Uh, lalu yang kedua yang juga mengagetkan adalah architecture of books. Nggak uh, pernah mikir kalau books itu sesuatu yang arsitektural, lebih mikirnya kayak oh books itu is just graphic design right tapi enggak juga karena books has its own kayak story of construction dan um, composition dan colors uh, so it's, it's very very similar in some ways and ada tiga dimensi juga gitu so this was really interesting the final project was to construct our own books jadi kita belajar binding belajar paper types belajar tipografi um, dan belajar sejarah kayak layout buku juga gitu Jadi semua orang kasih teks yang sama dan kita harus interpretasi gimana cara kita mau um, like make make our own version of this. Gitu. Yang menarik waktu itu ada teman yang bikinnya dia silk screen di toilet paper gitu. Jadi dia punya waktu final exhibitionnya dia taruh toilet paper ada tulisan teksnya gitu. Um, terus yang terakhir adalah rice building workshop um, yaitu membangun kayak construction di kampus. Kebetulan pada saat ini kita partisipat di solar decathlon di Washington DC. Jadi um, ini membangun solar home gitu ya. Uh, waktu itu uh, kampus kita konsepnya adalah affordable solar house dan tipologinya adalah ini uh, apa Houston row houses. Jadi kayak namanya shotgun. Jadi dari depan ke belakang itu bisa apa the corridor and then it fits to different rooms gitu. And yeah, this was also interesting. Soalnya first time realizing sesuatu yang high tech bisa uh, juga geared towards affordability. Um, okay, lalu sekarang akan fokus ke first year. Jadi first year ini ini muridnya ini muka saya waktu itu um, ada 25 murid. Lumayan diverse. Kayak people come from different states, uh, juga different countries. Uh, quite interesting. Um, di semester pertama ini kita belajar sesuatu yang abstrak gitu jadi um, komposisi grid um, lalu belajar plan section elevationnya um, kita harus memilih buah atau sayur gitu terus instead jadi instead of building jadi atau saya bilangnya apa ya jagung gitu jadi you have to um, draw the section elevation of these fruits and vegetables lalu belajar tiga dimensinya juga um,
Halo, maaf banget internet di rumah hmm. lagi tiba-tiba disconnect. Coba saya set routernya sambil kirim. Saya Yo, lagi lagi ini lagi download uh, filenya, tapi mungkin kamu bisa oh. uh, sambil nunggu nih ada satu pertanyaan Diana mungkin sambil nunggu saya download selesai. Ini pertanyaannya quite general sih, cuma mengenai uh, five years program gitu kan. Apakah di yeah, boleh. lima tahun semua major itu lima tahun di semua major in architecture apakah ada minor di program architecture itu dulu lah sambil nunggu ini ya saya download file minor di architecture tergantung um, tergantung universitasnya ya saya lupa kayak di di res nggak ada deh minor di architecture iya terus apakah seluruh program arsitektur tuh five years in US probably Di US um, ada empat tahun dan lima tahun. Uh, bedanya empat tahun dan lima tahun adalah kalau four years it, kalau five years itu what is called professional degree. Jadi it means uh, after you go to school for five years, you are qualified to uh, take the exam to become a licensed architect. Sedangkan kalau uh, degree dari four year program, you don't get to uh, take the license. Gitu. You have to go to master's degree. And then after you finish your master's, then you can um, take the license. Gitu sih beda. And that's the major difference. Dan sebenarnya kalau ngikutin program 4 tahun, jadi lebih lama sekolahnya gitu. Dan yang menentukan adalah um, accreditation board. Jadi um, setiap 6 tahun gitu, ada accreditation board yang traveling around the US dan mereka audit uh, program-programnya gitu sih. Jadi mereka akan sit in the classes terus melihat apakah benar nih um, mereka mengikuti standar untuk akreditasi to get the five year program to get the professional program gitu. Hi, can I ask a question? Yes, sure, sure. About um, Diana, uh, your year out. So, do other schools with five-year programs also have year outs as part of the architect license requirement? Yeah. Uh, the year out is specific to Rice. So, okay. I think, yeah, so only, as far as I know, the one that's truly like one year out and then you get assigned, you get like a matching program with the office is, is only Rice. Um, I know in Canada, there is another program like that. I think Toronto, um, they do like three years school and then like one semester out and then come back to school for one year and then one semester out. Um, so it's similar but broken down into uh, like six months off. Jadi uh, maybe they work for six months instead of one year gitu. Okay, so maybe you, ha- you will talk about this in your presentation but like your year out, so then does RICE or the AIA try to regulate what you're learning? to make sure that you know you're not getting good experience from office and they're not just using you you know you're out um the, the the so to get your license you have to satisfy like six uh, categories mm-hmm. and that's uh, being regulated by the IDP it's called intern mm-hmm. development program So that's also under the accreditation board and AAB, right? Um, Not National Architecture Accreditation Board. So, what? How you make sure you don't get used, gitu? Um, basically, the kantor, uh, you have to log in your hours to this program, right? And then you have to pick a supervisor um, that can, uh, kaya, confirm that you have uh, completed your internship based on these six categories. Yeah. That's quite similar to the UK as well. You have to submit a report when, at the time you want to do the exam. Oh, in UK, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's very similar, yeah. Let me see. I think my internet is working. Sorry, guys. Sorry? Okay, let me see. I'm waiting for... Uh... <laughs> Another two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Udah nih lagi connect ke Zoom. Maaf ya, ini kalau work from home jadi kayak gini nih. Internetnya nggak kuat. Ya, yeah, yeah, ini lagi menunggu dua menit. 
mungkin buat yang lain di sini kalau ada yang mau nanya atau apa silahkan ya sambil nunggu tolong di accept Dian yang satu lagi ya oh Dian yang satu lagi ya udah 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 ya satu menit lagi satu menit lagi sebentar Tadi okay, ya, oh ini, oh ini pakai ini ya, HP ya sekarang. Sekarang pakai laptop sekarang baru nariset kartunya. Apa? Baru nariset internetnya tadi. Oke oke. Oh jadi ini aja kan yang share, share screen? Ya, saya share, saya share. Kamu apa saya nih? Oh pada fit aja share boleh? Enggak, saya masih 55 seconds lagi kalau mau coba ya nggak apa-apa. Saya matiin video ya, aja. mungkin lebih kuat dari video ini. Ya. Langsung aja, ya ntar kalau ini baru saya masuk. Lagi. Kita udah sampai. Tadi kita ya. Tadi, ya, tadi, ngomongin, ya. tadi ngomongin Toy udah ke cover belum ya? Udah ngomongin first year kok tadi. Udah ya, ini eh, Toy tadi sampai sini kan ya. Oke, okay, ya. Jadi ini uh, serunya mulai memakai alat-alat di workshop gitu ya. Jadi um, pakai table saw gitu-gitu lumayan menarik juga sih dalam belajar yang di dalam wood. Um, habis itu the last project of the first semester was um, something more realistic. Jadi kita harus bikin cardboard chair. Um, terus ya cardboard chair harus bisa uh, menahan beban manusia gitu. Dan yang terakhir adalah um, Path and place. Jadi dari dari studi yang abstrak itu gimana caranya kita mengkonstruksi suatu naratif lalu um, menjadi sebuah kayak arsitektur gitu. Hmm. Oke, okay, tahun kedua um, proyeknya hanya dua saja. Eh, semester kedua tahun pertama proyeknya pertama itu adalah analisa historik studies. Jadi tiap tahun beda-beda, tapi pada tahun saya ini ada filosofua, falling water, impact dan lain-lain. Lalu kita dibagi menjadi grup, gitu ya. kita harus analisa konteks, program, uh, spatial order, structure, geometri, circulation. Jadi benar-benar um, understand um, the house and set up. Uh, lalu kira-kira beginilah eh, hasil akhir, pin up gitu ya, pin up dari proyek ini. Jadi um, kita belajar secara proper gitu, elevation, taxonometry. Ini masih mix antara gambar pakai tangan dan Um, pakai komputer gitu, um, lalu bikin market dan juga perspektif uh, perspektifnya be harus benar gitu jadi saya jawab pakai tangan. Um, ini proyek grup lainnya dan proyek terakhir di tahun pertama adalah our first building design project um, yaitu motorcycle museum dan ini um, sintesis dari segala yang kita pelajari. Gitu. Um, lalu Oke, itu tahun pertama. Ini semester terakhir yang tadi Hong Kong Studio. Uh, jadi ini Option Studio, again, um, boleh memilih antara dua, dua studio. Dan menariknya di sini kita gabung dengan master students gitu. Um, dan master studentnya mereka background-nya bukan arsitektur. Uh, jadi membawa perspektif yang lumayan berbeda juga. Uh, dan di studionya ada 11 uh, murid gitu ya. Dan ini final reviewnya bentuknya um, diskusi dan apa yang was quite interesting. Um, jadi dibagi dari uh, kurikulum dari um, studio ini tiga part gitu. The first part is research, the second we design the master plan, and then the last one each team uh, fill the master plan. Gitu. Um, so this was the first part is five week research. Uh, so The, the end of this five week research is we went to Hong Kong. Jadi sebelum ke Hong Kong, kita harus research everything that we want to focus on in the study. Uh, so we look into the relationship of Hong Kong and Shenzhen, um, apa ya, belajar infrastructure, density, industry, economics, dan lain-lain. Um, jadi kita dibagi jadi empat grup. Setiap grup dapat research topic di atas ini dan uh, kita harus presentasi ke depan. Uh, that way we get to learn all these topics without having to research all of them. Uh, dan dibukukan juga, jadi ini menjadi sebuah handbook gitu sebelum kita pergi ke home. Dan akhirnya kita pergi dengan apa yang berbekal knowledge yang sudah dipelajari dan dikontraskan dengan apa yang kita find out in real life. Um, 
Dan bagian kedua dari studio ini kita balik ke Houston, uh, lalu rembukan gitu ya, um, oke okay, kita harus pilih site apa yang berdasarkan analisa yang udah kita lakukan, berdasarkan site digitnya, dan akhirnya kita memilih uh, site yaitu former airport in Hong Kong, um, ini landasan uh, pesawat terbangnya dan the, the studio about, oke okay, how do you design a master plan in a city that's so um, In a city that's so dense, how do you design something when um, a new a new plot of land opens up? Um, ini ini hasil dari master plan yang um, didesain. Uh, ada beberapa konsep yang dieksplor gitu. Lalu akhirnya jadi seperti ini. Um, juga terus akhirnya dan dan gimana akhirnya jadi Uh, yaitu ini tipo, typology research. Jadi setiap grup yang terdiri dari 2 sampai 3 orang uh, di assign uh, we got assign all these different urban typologies. Analyze itu how how do you integrate these typologies into the master plan? So again each group has two parts research and design uh, and I'll go through each of them um, in the next slides. So in the parallel slab, um, so on the left side is the research and on the right side is the design and how it's integrated into the master plan. Maybe I, I don't go into detail to design and just like go through um, all the typology. Lalu yang kedua adalah housing estates, jadi um, tower, housing towers, very dense housing towers. So this team looked at the history and how it arrived into the pencil towers. Uh, yang juga penting sama infrastructure and they take these elements and make it into something right like in master plan so in this case um, how do you integrate uh, something monumental and including public space and a new um, MPR into the housing estates the next typology is the urban villages Um, so this was inspired by the Kalimantan city, which was uh, located nearby. And then um, how do you recreate this kind of like what we call the phenomenal density in a new about being romantic that we want to recreate something that happened before. How do you reinvent that in this um, new site? Um, and then the last one is monument. Jadi, in a master plan, how do you integrate monuments yang enggak terlalu random, masih kontekstual, dan becomes the um, kind of organ organizing um, elements in, in the city. Uh, so, the, the big part of uh, this team's proposal is to create a stadium in Hollywood di bawah, and the, uh, how the stadium becomes a part of the uh, Hong Kong uh, nightlife. Uh, there's a musical light gitu, kalau di tiap malam jam 8 malam itu gitu, mampunya um, dance with the music gitu. and how that that how this new master plan integrates with with the rest of the city. Um, okay, the next slide is quite heavy, so it might take some time. Okay. Um, lalu we also made a model. Jadi um, bikin marketnya rame-rame. Lalu setiap tim yang assign with the typology, then you fill in your own design. And that's it. So this is the last slide. Uh, this is our final board as a class. Um, so the left is the master plan, and then again like each team fill in their respective parts. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Oh, great. Um, I maybe I'm just gonna jump into questions. If there's anything else you like to share about your experience generally from Rice compared to your masters or or anything. Me or someone else asked. Oh, I'm 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 asking you as a, as you know reflecting on 
your work. I guess maybe I don't know how long it's been since you've graduated. Now you look back. Mm. Um, yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I think to me, undergrad was because it was um, many different exposure. Gitu ya. Jadi yang 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 terakhir di explain adalah urban urban design. Of course, it's not how urban design office works in real life. Cuman, this is like a fun introduction to how we can think about a city. And then the first semester was like, you know, using fruits and vegetables, which is like weird if you think about it. It, it has nothing to do with buildings. So I, I like the very abstract, the contrast between the very abstract and understanding that principle and somehow being able to carry it through like more complex programs. Um, I think uh, in contrast to the grad school, some research topics, people under that would be building the skills, the building blocks of how to become an architect, to understand the history, um, you know, how to draw proper like drawings, renderings, representing idea. Um, and then maybe in grad school, it's more about the research idea itself and how you expand on that. Yeah. Were, were there any like key practices or ways of thinking from Rice University that continues to guide you until now? Uh, yeah, I think in particular, we were taught to think um, in concepts. Um, apparently from the like one year working program, the feedback was like, oh, uh, Rice students were really good in drawing diagrams. So I think that came up uh, um, from the curriculum, right? Like being able to um, explain an idea through uh, diagrams, like how do you take something more complex and make it digestible? Um, make it uh, does anyone else have questions? Otherwise, I'm going to keep going. Um, so what, uh, I think that your year out is very interesting um, because actually just around the world, not many schools do that part of it, you know, they just kind of let the students graduate, off they go. Um, so I wonder what this year out had, uh, what impact it had on you, like in terms of your design thinking, your methods, maybe your perceptions of architects and society, and then coming back to school again, still within undergrad. Yeah, I think the year out, um, let me go through that slide. Um, the year out is different for many people. Actually, some people after the year out, they decide to not do architecture. Um, they do <laughs> Yeah, they're like, okay, this is not what, like sitting in front of a computer doing AutoCAD, <laughs> you know, every day is not. So that was good for them. Um, for me, uh, at that time, I was in New York. I was working for Todd Williams, Billy Sian. Um, what did I get out of it? I think um, because our first four years were so conceptual and not like you know about like necessarily detailing understanding building as science in the real life, it was quite eye opening how different um, how different like an architecture practice is from academia. Um, so yeah, it's it's a lot more about clients, right? And then there's a lot more administrative things. Um, so yeah, I think to me it was the contrast of that. Then after that, you come back to school. Did you feel like suddenly very practical headed, or did you feel like you really miss the conceptual and the academic, you know, discussions? Mm, I think after I came back from that, um, I'm I'm okay with the more practical. I and mean, we also had yeah. I think like after that, um, we we know like we only have one year, and then we have to you know, join the real world. So I was quite ready. Yeah. <laughs> I was quite ready for that. Yeah. I think to me, like I want to do things, so I don't necessarily like. I love the conceptual stuff, but at the same time, you know, like what what it takes to get something built is an architect. It's a it's a practice, right? It's not like academia or both. Some people do. Um. Oh, that that kind of is an interesting link to the building workshop elective that you took. Um, is like construction knowledge actually important part of the school? Like, do they connect it with your other design modules? Construction knowledge, um, not really like construction itself, but I guess more like proper design drawings. Did he in fourth year? I, I don't put it here because 
uh, I think at that time um, in 2010, they just started this program, but in the fourth year, um, the studio is, this one advanced topic in architecture one, it's supposed to be a, they call it totalization studio, which means um, you actually design something and the critiques are not just like critiquing your idea, but they, in, they in, invite um, facade consultant, structural engineer, basically people in practice to criticize your project. So that, uh, that studio was about integrating real life um, methods into your drawings. Basically. And then, so yeah, I guess that's not really the, the building workshop, but the building workshop helped because if, if you took that course before, then you kind of know a little bit here and there. Although it's wood construction, so it's something, it's like quite different than designing a museum. But I, I think the idea is there. Um, you mentioned that uh, to go, to be qualified to do the year out, the teacher would have to assess, you know, do you represent Rice University well, right, for these companies to accept you? So mm -hmm. what kind of assessments did the tutors use to, you know, gauge the students thinking, seeing that everybody kind of picks all kinds of subjects and electives? Yeah, I think um, usually it's based, I, I think generally it's based on GPA. Oh, so, okay. you know, if your grades are above a certain point, then you're qualified to apply. And then they read your essay. Um, and again, it's, a, it's quite a small school. So if, I think you get to know each other quite well. And yeah, as far as hard criteria though, it's, it's the grades. And the grades mm -hmm. represent, the grades requirement represent uh, various classes, right? Like the required courses in the first four years. It's like studio and then a certain like classes and structure. So, yeah. Um, I think another impressive thing about your course is the ratio of one to five students. Um, how did how did you like take advantage of that, or how did that really you know impact how you were learning architecture? Yeah, I think um, it it felt like we were in one big house together because we were always in studio. So you, you get familiar with the faces of students and faculty to the point that they know you by name. I think it's quite mm -hmm. rare that every, every you know, studio professor knows their student by name and they remember your project. So that felt like, you know, you're like taken care of in some ways. Um, so yeah, and, and it makes it approachable, right? That's the most important takeaway. Like it, it makes them like not a friend, but like they're very, very, very approachable. You can just like knock on their office door and discuss ideas. Um, or you can, they're just like, you know, email someone, if I try to talk to someone, they'll reject me. Even if you're a first year student, you know, trying to, um, approach someone who's maybe more like well-known, uh, they would not take more you. Um, and then, uh, I mean, this is the case in the UK, but since like, you have such a close relationship with a tutor and with other tutors, how, um, how much do they influence your, your design, you know, your design outcome? Like, is it just on the level of um, just basic on, on the brief or do they try to steer it based on their philosophies and like do students actually choose these tutors based on that or do you not have a choice? Um, okay. I think the first few studios um, it was designed to be more foundational so it's mm -hmm. less about the teachers like um, oh, okay. specific research right, or yeah. interest so for example like these kinds of projects it's very it's more like foundational, right? Like there's only certain ones you can yeah. approach it. Um, so I would say like the first three years, it was um, less less of a teacher's influence and more like instilling basic knowledge and understanding. Uh, and then I would say the last few years, especially the option studios, um, you really get to like, either you subscribe to their ideas or you don't. Um, but I guess we were so young, I, you know, we were fans of the professors, right? If you pick their options to then chances are you like what they do. I'm trying to, oh, man, I think it. yeah, but for example, um, this video, scroll up. 
the one with Eva Frank, uh, it was very memorable because it was not like architecture in a way. It was architecture, but not architecture. So she has this way of looking at architects as, you know, being a player in like, it was like political, it was ecological. So um, it was, I think it was the first time that we were presented the idea that architect is, you know, like a political player in a way in this, like in, in the world. And um, like biasanya kalau site itu one building site, her site is like one twelfth of the world. So that was also challenging. Um, and I think you have to like kind of be open to accepting the idea if you're going to take that studio. So yeah, I think in that sense, it, it really influenced um, the way we think. Um, and I, I think the way, yeah, I think the way we think is some of the principles, I can see that it stems from this studio still until now. Sorry, uh, Eko Purwono has another question. Jadi tahun kelima itu di luar Prodi. Maybe you want to answer? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Jadi tahun kelima itu di luar Prodi. Di luar? I don't know what that means either. Uh, mungkin maksudnya gini, kali. maksudnya apakah program tahun kelima itu not uh, considered as a regular program? Oh, uh, the, the working year or the... The fifth academic? year, the fifth year, the fifth year. Because, I mean, just to give you a context, mm -hmm. I mean, like in Indonesia, we don't have fifth year program, right? Yeah. So what we have is only four years program. Mm -hmm. So like uh, now you're uh, presenting to us that there's a fifth year, a five, the fifth year, the five year program in the US. So maybe the question is more like, so whether this fifth year is actually integrated to the regular program or is it, it's kind of outside? The, the core program. Oh, okay. Uh, the fifth year is integrated into the regular program. So if you apply to RISE, it's assumed that you will go through the five years. Um, it's only like if you decide to drop out, then, you know, then if you want to drop out, then at least stay until the fourth year so that at least you get a degree, <laughs> basically. But the, it's designed to be five years. If you go, if you apply for a specific four year program, um, the curriculum will be different. It will be less focused on studio. I, I think four years program, usually you don't start studio in the first two years, but maybe Paul will talk about that in more detail. But yeah, um, like when you when the school offers five-year program, um, it is assumed that you take it all the way to fifth year. So is it possible, like for instance, if I admitted to the four years program and in my fourth year, I, 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 well, I, 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 have, I have, you know, I want to, go to the fifth year? Is it possible or, I, or, or is it not possible? Um, at RISE, when you apply, you apply to a five-year program. So you, so you can, after four years, you can decide um, if you want to leave, then it's fine. If that makes sense. So you cannot apply to the four-year program. You can only apply oh, to the so, year. Oh. Yes. Basically, oh, if, you, so basically if you decide, uh, yeah, if, if you do four years, basically you don't complete the the B art, right? Which is the then you get the Bachelor of Arts. A bit like a an option, an option, right? So it's you an, can decide. With, okay. Yeah, you can decide, but if you say you're only applying to the four year program, you pro you don't get admitted. I think. I find it really interesting that the four-year mark is the deciding factor. Normally in first year, you're like, oh shit, this is so much drawing and I don't know what's going on. Normally the first year is that crossroad is like, this is not for me. Do a lot, do most people drop out in the fourth year or is it like earlier on? Or is it the fourth year is suddenly super hard and suddenly that's the test of, you know, your stamina? Um, usually the first year, well, in my class of uh, 25 people, I think at the end of the day, 20 people ended up going through the five years. Uh, some people, I think two people dropped out in the second year. Um, and then the rest like throughout. So it depends on their, um, on their um, trajectory, right? So for example, 
someone who decides they absolutely don't want to do architecture, maybe they, they drop out after first or second year or third year, and then they change to other major like art or something else, right? So they can still use the credits at Rice to, to switch major to other things. So they don't waste too much time. But if you want to, if you at some point decide, okay, I don't want to be an architect, but I want to be in architecture, maybe as academia, maybe you just want to focus on history, theory, criticism, you want to do PhD and stay in academia. So you don't actually need the professional degree, right? So then you actually just, you quit on the fourth year and then maybe you apply to grad school in somewhere else to, to go on that PhD track. Yeah, so I think it depends. But usually people who finish in fourth year, they, they still want to do architecture, maybe switch to something a bit related. I forget this five year was related to if you want to go on to do the license, because at this point, yeah. um, the board considers that you're ready. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Someone in our class dropped that their fourth year and then applied to uh, an Ivy grad school and then on the PhD track. And he's now like a writer. It's more like a, you know, architecture critic, which makes a lot of sense. Then you don't waste that one year. Yeah. Uh, just wondering, I mean, the US itu kan options banyak ya dia. Maksudnya, well, it, it is uh, to my knowledge that uh, other program, ada, ada sekolah yang cuma punya four years program mm -hmm. and they don't have five year program. Right. right. I mean, uh, I mean, in terms of pedagogy or in terms of the how they learn in the studio, is it going to be very different? Um, for the, the four years program, I mean, they're just the four year program and the, the five years program. Um, so that's something I actually don't know. And maybe Paul is more qualified to talk about that because MIT undergrad is four years. Um, yeah, I think I think most of the people I met, maybe because I'm a practicing architect, Jedika, most of the people I met went to the five year programs. But I think to my understanding, the four year program, because it's not um, regulated by an architecture board, it's a lot more loose. So maybe it's, it's more different from school to school, right? Whereas if you go to the five year program, um, even within, even in different schools, you will get, you know, like three courses of structure, 10 studios. Whereas I think if you, if you compare the four year programs, it's, it might be a lot more varied because there's no, there's no like, board that oversees it. Oh, oh, menarik ya. Jadi sebenarnya yang diakreditasi itu yang five years program ya. I mean, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the professional track ya. Iya. Yeah. Jadi kalau kita ambil MBSC, MBA, four years program itu sebenarnya memang nggak masuk dalam professional track. Enggak. Ya, biasa kalau kayak gitu tracknya, if they want to go professional, then they take master's degree. And then the master's uh, program would have to be an accredited program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's actually the interesting thing in the uh, in US system, yeah. Because options are banyak, yeah. I mean, uh, kalau di, di ada grad yang nggak professional degree, you can still uh, jump into professional track. I mean, by taking the uh, professional degree in the master program. Gitu yeah, kan? betul. Yeah, kan? Jadi, Jadi kayaknya option itu enggak kalau kayak di UK kan sebenarnya to my knowledge itu cuma one one way ya. You you have to take the part one part two program if you want to get, to be apa ya acknowledged in the as a professional. Uh, I mean if you want to go in a, or to want to uh, to be ya banyak banyak pasti mungkin kalau uh, ya uh, soal ini sebenarnya balik ke soal studio tadi tadi kan sebenarnya kalau Diana kan banyak cerita soal you you, you are no practitioner lah ya terus uh, <coughs> terus uh, banyak kalau kita bicara dengan studio segala macam uh, tadi mungkin Dika juga udah singgung soal apakah uh, ada apa bahwa kesenjangan itu ada antara studio di kampus dan di universitas practice for sure gitu kan nah uh, tapi kalau sebagai practitioner sendiri sebenarnya paling enggak sekarang gitu ya if you reflect gitu ya 
apa yang sebenarnya bisa dibawa dengan pembelajaran itu ke praktis ya dengan that kind of you know learning style that kind of pedagogy apa yang kira-kira takeaway-nya tuh apa ya dari jadi dari dari sekolah ke yang yang bisa dibawa ke praktis gitu ya Ya, mungkin. Apalagi ya, terutama dengan learning style seperti itu ya. Mungkin kalau soal kontennya kan, I think more or less di setiap sekolah sama soal structure, soal materials, ya, something like that kan. Tapi kan tiap sekolah punya gaya masing-masing dalam memberikan exercise misalnya. To tailor the brief. Nah, nah mungkin pertanyaan lebih ke situ, apakah specifically gitu, about the brief, gitu ya, exercises, segala itu, ada apa kontribusinya, gitu, what is your, your take away, gitu, from this kind of learning style? Iya, yeah. I think maybe the ability to um, distill problems into, you know, more digestible or abstract kayak concepts, and then being able to present different ideas, right? Jadi lebih ke, ini sih, Pak David, lebih ke, Uh, opening possibilities of yeah. different ways to solve problems gitu. Kalau well, karena kalau kita nggak belajar abstraksinya, I think it's not then you'll be a bit more like yeah. um, terkotakkan dalam suatu cara solve problem. Tapi kalau bisa lebih diabstraksikan kan, jadi kayak when you see a problem, you see there is like maybe five different ways to approach it. Well, Paul is here. So hi, Paul. Um, Hello. Are you? Hi, hi. Um, sorry, I'm. Uh, I have to turn off my camera right now because of my network connection. But nice to see you, finally. Uh, so we have already done the first presentation from Diana about uh, her experience in Rice. So and uh, we, while waiting for you, we already had a bit of discussion about, I mean, uh, her experience and. Uh, What is the contribution of the the studio to her practice, and uh, I think it's quite really related to the thing that you're going to present today, right? About the connection between you know the learning style, the learning mode in the undergrad, the five, the four years program, the five year program, and then what is the what the you know the, what the the students students can expect from the the the, the learn, I mean the, this this uh, program if they want to be an architect, I mean. So uh, I think uh, let's I mean let's let's start your presentation then. Well, the time is okay. yours. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to start by showing a, kind of what I was doing in Chicago for 16 years at the Illinois Institute of Technology, and then I'll and I'm going to go through that really quick, and then I'm going to jump onto what we're doing here at MIT. Is that okay, or do you want me to just talk about MIT? No, no, that's fine. That will okay. be very interesting. All right. Um, let me see. Um, okay, can you see this black and white photo? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so this is the this is Mies van der Rohe's Crown Hall in Chicago, um, and this is where architecture happens at the Illinois Institute of Technology. Um, I think this is a photograph of what it looked like when it was more or less first built. Um, but back in 2013, 2014, uh, we, we uh, had a new dean takeover and, uh, and he kind of put this book together, which was also a polemic about the, the approach he wanted to take with the program. Uh, it was called, uh, his name was VLR the, the uh, and his program was called Nowness. And he kind of broke down the Bachelor of Architecture degree. You can see it on the left here into um, the first couple of years he called element. Then he said single, meaning like single family dwellings, then hybrid or single could be single uh, user type as well. Hybrid was mixed use type buildings, institutional, and then sort of the metropolis or the city. And so I actually ran the element program. So most of my images really come out of that program. Um, and so one of the things we did was we We kind of broke it down into design, technology, history, theory, culture, design, communications, professional practice, and general studies. These were the areas that um, undergraduates would jump into almost immediately. Um, this is a, a cl class I taught where it was kind of like a professional practice class, but mostly with just guest speakers coming in to talk to students. And so we brought 
uh, guest speakers in from just about every type of architectural practice you could think of in Chicago. Uh, we brought in structural engineers, landscape architects, historic preservation, anything we, we thought uh, students might be interested in long term. Um, in terms of the actual breakdown of the program, uh, I kind of split it up into um, different skills and exposures that the students would have. So surface, threshold, stair, space, foundation, a pavilion, and then urban infill. These were kind of the main things we were going to cover. And then we were dealing with things like uh, design communication, history, theory, et cetera. Um, so, you know, the question was, when does first year architecture at IIT begin? These were the studios. Um, they're pretty big. They can be anywhere between 60 and 120 students uh, in each year. And so depending on how many students that told us how many faculty, because we were always trying to stay within the sort of 12 students number, 12 to 15 maximum. Um, the first assignment was to draw and cut a line. These are some of the, the big words or the darker words are the ones that we were kind of celebrating in terms of def definition for each of the students to learn. Uh, these were some of the skills they were learning. And these were some of, the, so these are just sheets of paper that have been cut with an X-Acto knife uh, in order to define what we call the line. So these are lines, more lines. Um, and it was up to students to really figure out what we meant by line, more lines. Um, and all of this was done uh, teaching hand drawing skills. So with a compass, a straight edge and a pencil, and then the X-Acto knife. Uh, these are our pinups or some of the big reviews where all of these line and field drawings ended up on the walls of Crown Hall. Uh, um, we ended up doing next a field. So these are some of the words we were using or that we were interested in the techniques. And so now rather than a, a, a single line, we're, we're looking at like drawing and cutting fields. Again, using a pencil, a straight edge, and a compass to build the constructions and then the exacto knife to cut the paper and bend it. So these are lots of different fields by all of the different students. Another pinup of student work. Um, and so the we did an assignment where we 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 explored the term extrude uh, using um, cardboard essentially corrugated cardboard. So these are um, these are kind of like landscapes, I guess you could say we were working with, and the students were asked to sort of move out of a two D two dimensional landscape into a three-dimensional landscape. And you can see, you know, like there's a real kind of celebration of individuality within this class so that each project really kind of takes on a unique uh, look uh, and or interpretation of what we would mean by the word extrude. Um, this is the event where we were starting to move from the 2D world into the 3D world uh, called cut, bent, fold. We're got, starting to get into things like light, shade, and shadow. These are more techniques the students are learning. Um, and so all of a sudden we're starting to move up vertically. Uh, and also the students are now starting to learn to draw things like plan, section, elevation, and, and assemble those drawings onto a single kind of composed sheet. So this is all happening. We're only about halfway through the first semester at this point, just to give you like a time context. And then of course, they're introducing characters or people into these uh, 3D models or into the drawings to begin to really understand the relationship between the scale of a building and the scale of a person. Um, this is a this is an assignment we did almost every year. I don't know if you know the the holiday in the United States called Halloween, where everybody dresses up. But we would have a Halloween party every year, and so about a week and a half before that party, we would have an assignment 
that essentially became a kind of Halloween costume. So this one was called Enhance, and the idea was to enhance the, the human body. Um, so again, we're working with the human body, a bit fun as well. Um, and so we provided to all of the students corrugated cardboard um, and, and string and some other materials that they could work with. And then we kind of set up, if you know the, the TV show Project Runway, we kind of set it up where uh, students would uh, be introduced and their concept behind their design would be read from a podium. And then they would um, kind of march down the aisle and be reviewed in the same way that you might be reviewed for Project Runway. Uh, so one of the things that's going on here is we're trying to get the students to sort of get to know each other better, to bond as a group, that kind of thing. So these are some of the projects that uh, students made up out of all of these materials. You can kind of see the Halloween decorations in the background. Um, so from there, uh, the last assignment of the semester was really a, a first kind of a stab at a building, you know, like to design and uh, and 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 construct uh, uh, a small um, outdoor pavilion in a park outside of Chicago. Uh, so now all of a sudden, the students have a lot of skills at their disposal. Um, and these are some of the pavilion drawings that the students made. So we went on a site visit, photographed and got to know the site, and then the students were able to make these projects. Um, and this is their first real introduction to 3D drawing software um, as well. So they're again learning how to model in Rhino and they're starting to use those models to generate plan sections, elevations, these sorts of things. Um, and, and, and we were always kind of big on this idea of physical model making in addition to the digital model making. So these are some of the models that were made out of basswood and um, uh, particle board. Um, so that same group of faculty and the same group of students moves into a second semester. And the semester was kind of in a way dedicated to the idea of uh, reducing, reusing, and recycling. And um, the, the first project we did with the students was to, um, I think it'll come up here. Um, I was able to get an entire tree donated to the class and each student got a, a piece of the tree. It was a tree that fell down in a store. So these are all of the students in our shop with their piece of wood. And then they were asked to go to a thrift store or like a, a, a store where people um, can buy used things and buy something there and then modify it. So these are all of the different projects that were built out of that piece of wood and um, the, the, whatever these students found at the, at the thrift store. So this is a student who bought a picture frame, dismantled the picture frame and then put it back together into this three-dimensional frame. Uh, so that was the original frame, there's the wood. And then this is their process for putting that together some of the drawings they made. Here's a student who bought some wooden hangers and used the hangers. Uh, this is like a, 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 a bench at the front door of your house where you can put your shoes and hang your hats and scarves, that kind of thing. There it goes. Um, um, this student got an old camera and took it apart. And then uh, he kind of studied the original camera through drawing. And then he started to make all kinds of new cameras out of the wood and then some of the parts of the original camera. So these are all of his cameras that he made um, out of the wood. And then uh, he's showing kind of how he's using them. To... Um, and then these are some of the photographs that he took with his wooden cameras. And then this student found one of these exercise machines that somebody abandoned. 
and kind of took it apart and then put it back together into this object that on the left it's compressed and then on the right it's when it's now expanded kind of like what the human machine uh, this was somebody who dismantled the picture frame and built it back up into a much more sort of three-dimensional uh, structure and that's sort of the final review where you get to see the students with all of their projects. Um, and then finally, the end of the semester was, um, we went into uh, what's called an alley in Chicago, which is the area behind the buildings. And we were looking at the possibility of, rather than using the alley for garbage pickup, to actually turn it into a, a kind of a secondary street where people could live. Um, and, uh, and so we picked the street in Chicago and uh, well, here we're on a couple of site visits too, I forgot. We're um, uh, church in Oak Park River Forest. Uh, we're visiting East Vanderoe's Farnsworth House out in Plano, Illinois. Um, and then this is our project uh, where we're looking at uh, how to reuse these alleys. And these are students working in groups to come up with big ideas as to what we might do. And these are some of the group drawings as to how they were proposing to kind of reimagine these alley spaces. Um, different groups came up with different ideas for how to do that. Um, and these are all of their different uh, group presentation type documents. Uh, here we are walking through the alley on the right. Um, that's what they kind of look like in the middle of winter in Chicago. And then on the left was the model of one of these reimagined alleys with all of the student uh, buildings. And this is another one of those where students kind of had to both do their individual buildings, but then also uh, build a model of what the entire alley would look like. So this is now just a few of the projects. This is a student that was really into bicycles. So his whole house is based on a, a bicycle repair service at the bottom and then a living space above. Then you can see like over the course of the year, they've acquired all of these skills that allow them now to design, draw, and model um, small buildings. I'll go through these pretty quick because there's, there's a, a few of them. And the, the idea here was to keep the scale of the architecture really small so that students could really get into all of the details in, in, in a project like this in about a half a semester. You can see some students really got into things even as far as like the material studies, colors, that sort of thing. Um, and of course, students come with different skill levels. Um, that was probably one of the more skilled students. And a lot of the conversation was around whether cars should be talking about just bicycles, um, any other types of alternative transportation. But I think a lot of the students worked with the idea of a, of a single car being stored uh, in the same way that uh, cars were stored previously in garages. They're, when the students are in our class, they're also taking another class at the same time where they're learning to use some of these digital tools. So we're not necessarily teaching all of the software in this class uh, because that's kind of happening elsewhere. Um, and then the students are bringing those skills into the classroom and putting them to work. So we don't have to teach things like Photoshop or we teach a little bit of Rhino, we teach a little bit of uh, AutoCAD, these types of things. but. Often they're getting some of the other skills outside of our class.
this is one of my students who loved comic books. So I made her draw hers as like, she both drew hers as a comic book, but then also uh, built, built the, designed and built uh, the building as if it were lived in as a comic book. Um, these are some of her drawings. Um, I always like, I like to have a soundtrack that goes with the year or the project. So these are all of the songs that the students uh, listened to when we were working. And you can see that the words in the songs were words that were incorporated into their projects over the course of the semester. Um, and sometimes the students would suggest songs that they thought would be appropriate to sort of add to our playlist. So this class, we this is a class that we developed over a number of years, and 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 at a certain point, we entered it into a competition for a, an AIA and a teaching award. Um, so from there, what students do is they go into the second year, and in the second year, they start to get into things like the more technical aspects of buildings, like building assemblies, curtain walls different types of materials used in architectural projects, that sort of thing. And these are some of the models of those um, projects that were built in the second year. I wasn't affiliated with the second, third, fourth, or fifth years. I don't have as much work to show, but uh, that's at least a, a glimpse into that world. Um, here's the additional projects. Um, and again, they worked at a relatively small scale in terms of like, uh, now we're moving from a single dwelling to a multi-family dwelling, uh, but that, in addition to the change in scale, the, the buildings are more complex because the students are being asked to include things like structures and mechanical, electrical, plumbing type systems. Um, so these are some of their projects. Um, Third year is a special year because it's um, maybe Diana talked about this, but this was um, a comprehensive building project that's required by the accrediting organization. So students really dig very deep into this idea of incorporating structures and HVAC type systems into their buildings. By fourth year, students start to have a choice of the, the instructor that they want to work with. And the same is true of fifth year. So because the school is in the city of Chicago, a lot of the practicing architects from Chicago teach at the school. So these few images are photographs of projects by the architects who've taught in this program at um, IIT. So this is Brennan Stuhl and Lynch's Racine Art Museum in Wisconsin, John Ronan's uh, project on the south side of Chicago. This was a project that was actually designed and built by students in Germany. It was a chapel. Um, this is a, an instructor that likes to do design build projects. Um, this is a house designed and built by the instructor who teaches all of the digital drawing type classes. Um, another instructor who um, does pretty high end interiors, but also um, uh, residential and, 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 and institutional type work. Um, years ago, Jeannie Gang taught at, at um, IIT, and this is her Aqua Tower in Chicago. Um, and then one of the larger projects by an architect named Andy Matter. Um, and then this is um, David Woodhouse. Actually, I worked for David Woodhouse, my first architectural job. Um, and then this is a, a, a synagogue by um, Carol Ross Barn. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's IIT. Um, and, uh, and I think similar to uh, Rice, uh, the school that Diana presented, this is a five-year Bachelor of Architecture program. And so over the course of five years of study or 10 semesters, the students have five electives. Um, and so they can group their electives into things like um, building technology or history theory criticism or digital tools. Um, but there's uh, not a lot of uh, leeway to do else other than architecture. Um, so this is very different from, um, I'm gonna, um, I have to do something here. I'm gonna pull up another presentation now. Um, uh, 
So this is now MIT, which uh, MIT um, And this, this presentation, because it has a couple of videos, I've had trouble with it in the past. So if, if something doesn't work, we might have to double back, but um, I'm gonna advance to the next slide. Tell me if you can see the next slide, which is kind of a, a map of all things at MIT. Can you see that? Or did it stay the same? Does it still say MIT architecture? It still say the same. Yeah, okay. Let me, let me redo this. Um, If it fails, I have to go with a different approach. Um, now is it kind of this crazy drawing of all of the different things happening uh, in MIT architecture? All right. Um, so this is a diagram that um, we, we made a few years ago of where architecture is at MIT. And so that, that central area is computation, building technology, architecture and urbanism, history, theory, criticism, and art, culture, and technology. And that sort of forms the core of architecture. But then students have access to a lot of different other areas at MIT, like the media lab through um, what are called um, undergraduate research opportunities. Uh, they can do work in urban studies and planning real estate, Sloan Business School, civil engineering, um, all of these different uh, things are available to students. Um, did that change to posters, um, like different images? Yeah, we can see different class? Okay, so it's working now. Um, so one of the things, so at MIT, um, students, when they apply to MIT, they don't apply to a particular major, they just apply and they get accepted. And so when they come to MIT, they have a year to decide what their major might be. Um, and so one of the things we have to do is find the students within that first year class that might have an interest in architecture or design. And then when we do, they're, they're, taking, they're, they're started on a sequence of classes. These are some of the posters we make in order to advertise or market the classes to students. Um, Go back one. Oh, okay. So this is a class we teach. This is the first design class. And the, the students who take this class, they're just taking it as what's called a Haas A class, which is a humanities and social science art class. Um, most of the students have never taken art classes before or architecture classes before. And so these are very basic drawing techniques that we're teaching at, at the very beginning of this class. Um, in order to help these students kind of uh, int get, get introduced to uh, design from an um, architectural perspective. Um, uh, interesting. Oh, there we go. Um, so these, the drawings that you, you saw, you know, that's like the first exercise, but very quickly we get into three-dimensional um, fabrication type of exercises. So on the left, these are projects that actually were done during COVID. So students were actually working from home or their basement of their parents' home, or in some cases, their dorm rooms. But these were projects that were made out of paper to celebrate light in one way or another. And then the projects on the right were uh, designed and made to um, weigh something. They were they were like a, a, a measurement device. And students at MIT, because they have interests in things like mechanical engineering, computer science, many other things, often their projects are very unusual. This is like a, a project where, up on the left there where you, a student, you can point this little device at any color you see on the street, and then you can calculate um, manually what the CMYK or RGB value is of the color you're seeing. Uh, and down here on the bottom left, I think this is my favorite project. The student heard that you could tell when a cupcake is ready by the sound it makes in the oven. So they did a test to see which cupcake came out best, the one you measured with a thermometer, the one you measured with a toothpick or their by sound. Um, so um, about half of the 
um, won't do any more architecture or design at MIT. They'll just go and do whatever else they might do. But the other half will move on to this class, which is uh, 4022 Introduction to Design Techniques and Technologies, where they're now starting to learn more about the materials and the tools involved in design. On the upper left, that's a drawing that was made using a laser cutter. So rather than cutting through the paper, they're just burning the paper. Uh, these are drawings that were crafted in a combination of rhino and grasshopper. Uh, the same is then done to sheets of metal using a metal laser cutter uh, in order to get these materials, these, these steel or, or metal sheets to then take on different or unique behaviors. Um, that's like the starting point of the class. The final project for the class is a group assignment where they were given sheets of plastic and they modified hair straighteners in order to seal the edges of the plastic and then built these like large inflatable um, uh, structures. And so this is one of the group projects where they could take these L-shaped uh, pieces, inflated pieces and assemble them in different ways. So here it is as this kind of linear uh, inhabitable space. And then on the bottom right is a, the same pieces being used to make a more radial space. Um, so at this point, students have to decide if they want to go and become a design major or an architecture major. So we're going to go down the path of architecture major. And, and with that, there's a sequence of classes that the students are required to take but then there are also a, a number of electives that they can choose from. I put this in just to show at, at, at IIT in Chicago, it was very easy to keep track of students and their progress through the program because they were all basically doing the same thing. At MIT, they're all doing completely different things. And so these are what are called audit sheets where we have to keep track of all of the classes that the students are taking. And not only are they taking all of these classes up top in architecture, but down here, we're keeping track of, uh, they all students at MIT have to take two calculus classes, two physics classes, a, a biology class, a chemistry class, and then in a, a collection of humanities and social science classes. So we're tracking all of that. They also have to have a concentration in a, in a, in a humanity or social science. I think this student is, um, uh, I wanna say this is a student, oh, religious studies is her uh, concentration. In addition, um, uh, so anyway, I just want to give you a sense of just how complicated MIT is behind the scenes. But by the third studio, students are being exposed to their first uh, building design problem. So these are some of the projects that were done um, in that class where students are now starting to learn more specifically about plan, section, elevation, uh, how buildings operate in terms of program, these sorts of things. Some additional techniques of drawing and illustration uh, to describe their projects. Um, and what happens is students then move on to like the next uh, building design class where the, the problems get more complex and then larger in scale. So, so this is a couple of images from uh, uh, the next studio called 4024. Um, 4025 is the final studio. And uh, uh, in some years, the students have traveled uh, to different parts of the world. Here they went to Morocco and did a project. Um, students have the option of doing a thesis project at the end of their um, time as an undergrad. Uh, and these are some of the thesis projects, everything from like a real building technology type project of turning small timbers into large structures, bamboo construction, landscape design. Uh, the variety is kind of almost endless. Um, in addition to what the students get in the classroom, uh, we try to put together work, I call them workshops, where we teach additional things like uh, how to get a summer internship. We brought uh, somebody from Bjarke Ingalls group in to talk about what they look for in a portfolio and a resume when they hire. Perkins and Will, another firm, came by to do something similar. We had recent graduates talk about the ar architecture licensure pro uh, process we did a graduate school application workshop um, and on, the, on down the line. So uh, there are things that are covered in the classroom, obviously, but then there are certain things that don't get covered that we pick up 
outside the classroom. Um, I think we missed one. So in, in because in the United States, uh, you need a professional degree in order to become a licensed architect. Our four-year undergrads need to go to grad school if they want to become a licensed architect. So these are a couple of examples of students who went to MIT as undergrads. Uh, in this case, the, the student then went to Columbia University for their master's degree. Uh, they worked for a couple of uh, firms. They qualified to take their licensing exam. They became a licensed architect. And then they designed this cool house and won an award. And I always say that's like the dream of most young architects in the United States is for that kind of sequence of events to happen. Um, this is another student who went to MIT as an undergrad. She went to Harvard for grad school. She worked for Herzog and Demuron, Zaha Hadid, um, and, uh, and uh, uh, opened up her own practice. She has two practices, one in uh, London and one in Seoul, Korea. And this is a hotel that she designed and built that then won an award. So, so that's like the dream. Um, now, oh, oh, so then this is, I wanted to show this because these are some of our, our recent graduates and where they end up. So where is at the Illinois Institute of uh, Technology in Chicago, about 90 per, about 95% of our students would graduate and go on to work for architecture firms. Um, at MIT, only about maybe 30% of our students graduate and go to architecture firms. Uh, they end up going to a lot of other places. Um, so here's like a, a product and UX designer uh, type Cool is a um, medical device design company. Um, uh, here's a student that double majored in uh, chemical engineering and architecture and is doing her PhD at Columbia. A uh, student who went on to Berkeley for design. Um, Michelle Manchetti is in, working for Goldman Sachs, so investment banking. Uh, Alicia Nimrick went on to grad school at Texas Austin. She, she, her, she almost had a double major in um, material science and architecture. And so she's pursuing that interest at the school that supposedly specializes in that sort of thing. Annie went on to uh, uh, product design engineer at Apple. And on and on, you can see like these students are kind of going everywhere and doing all kinds of things. Um, so uh, when I first started back, I, I went to MIT for graduate school many years ago and about six years ago, I came back. And at that time, um, we, we were starting what was called a design minor. So in other words, students from any major at MIT could minor in design within the Department of Architecture. And, and, um, and so I was asked to draw a map of where design is at MIT. And, uh, and so I drew this map, which was like a labyrinth filled with Russian nesting dolls to show how complex MIT is. Like if you try to find anything at MIT, you have to go through a labyrinth and then a, a sequence of Russian nesting dolls. And the head of the department didn't like this map, so she had me draw another map. And so I drew this one, which I called the periodic table of design elements at MIT. Um, and so you can kind of see an actual map of MIT in the background. But what this is showing is where you'll find the most design at MIT. So all of the departments come with a number. So course four is architecture, course two is mechanical engineering, six is electrical engineering, computer science, 11 planning, and 21 humanities. Uh, in the arts. And these are the areas where you find the most design and everything else are areas where you find less design, but you still find design. Um, I went through all of the classes offered to undergrads at MIT. And if that class had design in its title or in its course description, I listed it. And I provide this to the students so that they know where they can go to get design classes that are connected to their particular interest area. And so there's like literally three pages or th three slides of, of all the different departments and all of the different design classes that are offered. Um, so this is a breakdown of our design minors. Like we have about 60 design minors and half of them usually are mechanical engineers and half of them are electrical engineers or um, computer scientists and then a few other majors. We're sometimes the second most popular minor at MIT and part of why I'm showing this is because a lot of the design classes that architecture students are in are filled with these students. So you're not just in a class with other architecture majors, but you're in classes 
with mechanical engineers and computer scientists and, and a whole slew of other types uh, that you then learn from. Um, this is a class I teach that's sort of an introduction to design where we bring in, again, alumni or people in and around MIT who, who different, do different types of design. Um, I'll skip that one. Again, these are like all of the different classes that are offered turned into posters to kind of add on. Uh, and or in this case, these are workshops that we put together. I think Diana was influential in this one, Lippincott. I think that was one of Diana's connections where we brought in a design consultancy to talk about why consulting firms are buying design companies. Um, let's see what else we have. Uh, Again, this is like one of these audit sheets for the design majors, where these are all of the design classes that we're tracking. Uh, and down here, you can see like that they took one, two, three, four, five, six classes in computer science, one class in mechanical engineering. Uh, this is a student whose concentration is uh, gen women gender studies. Um, and then this student, I know who she is. She's one of my advisees. And she took a year off and she's working for Amazon Robotics here in Cambridge. And then she'll come back next year to finish uh, her, her degree. Uh, so students do that too. This is sort of the classes or the class selections for the minors in design. Um, there's, so if you want to be a design major or minor, there's a, another sequence of classes. And architecture students can take these classes, but they're primarily uh, design students. We'll see if my movies work. This is, I've run into some trouble with these, but um, yeah, this isn't gonna work. But um, let me let me, um, let me me stop sharing for a second and see if I can get the movie to work. And then if I can, I'll come back on with this. Uh, Yeah, I have a feeling. I have a feeling I'm not going to be able to show you my movies. <laughs> So we'll skip the movies, uh, but I can talk to you through what's going on here. So this is a class where students work with data and they turn their data into interactive graphics. Uh, did the slide switch okay? Um, now we're, it should say visual communication fundamentals on the upper left. This is a class, it's a, it's a, it's a graphic design class, but it's done sort of in an MIT fashion, for instance, here, students are crafting an alphabet out of uh, one of these um, Leatherman tools or Swiss Army knife type tool. Uh, and but this student, she she's a guitar player, so she would strum her guitar in the shape of a letter A B C D E F G, and she would record the sound, and then she would write code so that when you type the word guitar, you could hit the play button and you would hear the sound of the guitar of, of the word guitar. So. Um, you know, MIT students, because they come with these different skill sets, they can do these sorts of things, even though they're kind of hanging out here in course four for architecture and design. Um, maybe this one will work. I don't know. Oh, there we go. This is a class called Advanced Product Design, where students designed eyewear based on a particular idea. So in this case, there were rubber glasses that could never break laser cut uh, uh, plastic glasses that folded like origami to make them structurally sound, roll up uh, sunglasses. And then this student made uh, this eyewear where she 3D, or she laser cut these acrylic pieces, glued them together with these gaps so that she could inject them with colored liquid. And then in the final piece of the movie, you'll see why she did this. for fashion, right, reasons. Okay. Uh, 
don't know if it's gonna allow me to advance or not. <laughs> um, hold on a second. I think I just crashed my presentation. Um, Let me try going back on there. Um, it's possible. I think that might be the end right now. The, the remaining slides were to almost like give you a sense of, yeah, I might have to stop this. I'll stop the presentation because it's all damaged now. But um, but basically what was going on there was, um, or what was coming up next was similar to what I had done before, which is to show you uh, where our design majors and minors end up. The student who did the eyewear um, that you saw in the movie, she works for, um, I believe Microsoft or Google as a UI UX designer. So even though she studied architecture um, and then she did this design class, she ended up in UI UX versus in a, in a situation where she would be designing buildings. Um, so I, hopefully that's good enough to kind of start the conversation if you have questions, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, thanks a lot, Paul. I'm um, sorry, I think David is still uh, occupied. Um, I don't know if Diana wants to ask any questions. I have a lot of questions. Um, I'm just going to be helping with moderating the Q&A. Okay. I don't think we've had any specifically. So I'm just going to shoot. Um, so a couple weeks back, we had a Saskia Lewis. She was in the Architecture Association Foundation program head. And we asked her, like, what is a sign of a success in the cohort? And she said there was actually failure watching students fail. So I was wondering what your version of success in the cohort is. Is it like how many patents you get or something? Well, I think, you know, what, what's interesting is when I first came back to MIT like six years ago, I, I was immediately frustrated by the fact that there were so few students interested in architecture. And of those interested in architecture, they didn't put in the same time and effort uh, that my students in Chicago did. Like in Chicago, in a five-year program, the students basically lived in the studio. They were there all day, all night, all weekend, that sort of thing. Here at MIT, like, every class in the undergraduate pr program is considered equal. So like we can't make the students spend more time on their architecture classes than they might be putting into their like calculus class, their chemistry class or whatever else they might be doing. And so like that was a, something I had to learn. So that was like, my own personal failure I had to kind of overcome. Like I felt like, oh my gosh, I, I'm not doing something right here because the students just aren't producing quality of work and there just aren't that many of them. But in, over the course of like the next couple of years, what I learned is that every MIT student is different. They're being encouraged to really explore everything and anything at MIT. And so MIT doesn't expect any student to really walk out of MIT with a degree in whatever, architecture and become an architect or mechanical engineering and, and become a mechanical engineer. Uh, they're just expected to go out into the world and do something amazing. Um, and, and, and so it's a very different take on like, um, like success, like success, I think previously for me would have been to become an architect, you know, to become a licensed architect. And, and that's not the success here at MIT at all. Um, and, and, and it's getting used to both by me, but by also the parents of these young people who, who are sometimes frustrated that their kids aren't graduating and going on, you know, into a field that they kind of trained for. Um, so, and I know that didn't answer your question of, of maybe like what failure looks like in the classroom. Success, yeah. But for instance, I mean, that, that example I gave you of the student who um, recorded the sound of a baking cupcake, she burn so many contact microphones like she was buying microphones off the internet the entire time we were working on that project in order because what she discovered is nobody's ever built a contact microphone that can withstand the temperatures of an oven uh, when you're cooking a cupcake so she had to she her project never was perfect by the end 
but it was such an amazing project that nobody cared, <laughs> you know, like nobody cared that it wasn't like, you know, uh, perfect in its ability to kind of show the data. Um, and, and I think she's, she's just one of many of students who kind of had similar uh, experiences. Um, yeah. Um, uh, you know, so your, your mindset in doing a tech technology, just more in the science part of your brain. And then there's design, there's design, you're trying to create a value out of nothing. Whereas in like science, you're trying to prove that, you know, your hypothesis works or not. How do you, how do you, um, you know, between IIT or MIT, how do you balance those two different, you know, schools of thinking and practice? Yeah, that's interesting. I think, you know, it's in, um, one of the things I discovered is uh, hopefully everybody remembers from maybe some science class they took, uh, the scientific <laughs> method, right? Uh, where, you know, you, you kind of form a hypothesis and then you, you perform a, a number of experiments to sort of test your hypothesis. And then you arrive at some type of a conclusion. And one of the conclusions might be that your hypothesis was incorrect, right? Uh, or and that's okay if it was wrong, right? Exactly. In, yeah. in the world of science, uh, you know, scientists are used to this sort of thing. You know that that that, and and so here at MIT, it's really easy to teach students uh, about failure because they, they they're very things like the science. Mess. So even though we teach the design process which, you know, of course, is really similar to the scientific method, right? There's a problem that needs to be solved. There's a, a concept or a, a collection of concepts you have as to how you might solve that problem. You then kind of explore a couple or a few of those ideas. You maybe bring one to fruition in the form of a prototype to test your idea. And then you decide how well did you solve the design problem? Like to me, they're almost the same. And that's the conversation you would have here at MIT, but like we would stick strictly to like architectural meta pinch out into art metaphors, but primarily we were working with architecture at MI at IIT, whereas at MIT we're working with everything else. Um, you know, at, at IIT, I, I I think we would maybe talk about computer science once a semester or once a year, and we never talked about machine learning or artificial intelligence and here at MIT, we talk about those things all the time, you know, and in, in, in their relationship to both contemporary architecture, architecture of the future as well. And so I've had to adapt as an instructor uh, pretty dramatically um, to, to, to teach in this program versus the program I was in before. Um, so, I mean, so when you, when you're, when there's the word technology in the school name, like IIT and MIT, um, there's some of like stereotypes that come up in mind, like, you know, it's futuristic, it's, there's a lot of computational design or something. Um, uh, how do you, is it still important incorporating like, you know, the real world out there, making things that, that work for people as opposed to just the futuristic things? And then is it also important the foundational knowledge or do students kind of come in quite, quite skilled? And you just kind of run with the brief or something. Yeah, well, um, at IIT in Chicago, if a student came in with skills, it was usually because they had like architecture classes in high school. Um, at MIT, if they come in with skills, it's in some area that's completely different. Like they may have built and competed uh, in robot competitions all through high school. And so somehow they are going to translate yeah. those skills into yeah. an architecture class, right? Or a design class. Um, or they'll come in with, you know, really deep backgrounds in a particular area of the sciences. Um, and so that's probably one of the more difficult things. I mean, definitely one of the things, like when I went to MIT and came back to Chicago, not many people in Chicago had met anyone from MIT and they would ask me at MIT and I would say well it's the most uh, amazing collection of of uh, creative nerds you'll ever meet you know and they they would laugh and then they'd say wait did you say it because they were laughing at the word nerd right hope maybe you know the word hopefully um but but then they would say wait did you just say creative and I'm like yeah creative like 
MIT people are the most creative people I've ever been around in my life. Like they don't, they don't look at anything as um, finished or complete. Everything is, it can be improved upon, can be made better. Um, and, and so I don't think like you can put any problem in front of an MIT student and they just go crazy, you know, trying to solve it because it's so much fun. Um, and if they don't have the skill, they'll pick up the skill um, in most cases because they don't mind the tool or the new technique to do that. Um, the other thing I've discovered is, you know, like um, at MIT, we hear maybe, you know, this acronym STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, right? And so one of the things I discovered is that at MIT, you can, you can study science, right? There are many sciences you can study. There are many engineering classes here at MIT. And then, of course, there's many math classes here at MIT. But you know what class you can't take? The class called technology. And there's no degree called technology. So, like, the acronym mm. doesn't work. So, of course, we prefer or I prefer the acronym STEAM, which maybe you've seen that one, science, technology, engineering, art, or architecture in math. And so uh, that's very much true of not just the architect and designer types at MIT, but really all of the students at MIT. And um, it's funny you just did use A for art and architecture interchangeably. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so does that kind of bring a kind of, what kind of conversations that, does that bring in the whole mix? Because, I mean, I was just thinking that in the American system where you can pick all kinds of electives. So all, that's like you said, all the students come with all kinds of interests, whereas I was a British train. So you kind of go in architecture, that's all you do. You cannot choose anything else, expect you to devote yourself to architecture. So yeah. how do you, uh, do you have like a kind of idea, even with the electives you put in, the kind of, um, I don't know, the shape of the students that come out? <laughs> I <don't know>. um, <laughs> I, I'll answer the last part of the question first. The, I, I thought I had an idea of what the shape would be of the students that would come out. But what I've discovered is, they're absolutely different, like every one of them. Um, I do a lot of career advising. So when students are ready to graduate, they'll come meet me and talk to me about, you know, jobs that they might have an interest in. And I don't think I've ever had a student, well, it's rare when a student will come in and say, I'm interested in working at this architecture firm. More often than not, they'll come in. And this is the last week I've had students come in and ask for toy design, uh, uh, in Washington, D.C., um, medical device design anywhere, um, and I've had. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't think. I'm trying to think of the third student that came by the other day. Oh, she ended up. She was working in the medical device field and is now moving on to um, work on uh, hardware for Microsoft. <laughs> but these are like these are students that are in all of our classes, but they're not necessarily heading off in the same direction. Um, you know, I, I, I think I, I, I get about, um, I forget how many, something like 300 emails a year from students around the world who want to come to MIT to study art and architecture. And the few that I get from the UK or from Europe anyway, West, uh, Western Europe, um, I always know why they're contacting us because they don't want the Western system. They don't want to be told, they don't want to be asked in seventh grade, what do you want to be when you grow up and be that career from seventh grade all the way through high school and then through college, right? Uh, they like the idea of MIT allowing them to just try everything uh, until they find the thing that really resonates. Um, it's more common here in the United States for colleges and universities to allow that sort of thing to go on. Um, Maybe not for Diana there, because she went to Rice, and so they made her like apply uh, to architecture, and then they kind of made her stay architecture, which is somewhat like IIT in Chicago. Yeah, uh, Paul, would you say that's kind of the key difference between the four-year and five-year undergrad program? Maybe because the five-year, you have the accreditation board kind of like watching over and making sure, you know, the program adheres to this professional degree requirements, whereas the four year is a bit more loose and therefore can, you can be more creative. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like for instance, at MIT in the grad program, we have a master of architecture program and that program is regulated by the NAAB. And that master program also has five electives in three years, right? Or give or take. Um, 
they're, they're, those programs, the five-year Bachelor of Architecture and, the five, and then the master's programs as, as regulated by the NAB are very consistent one to another. That's why like you can look up online the rankings of five-year undergraduate architecture programs because they're easy to compare. They all basically teach the same classes. Um, and so all you have to compare then is, well, who has the best professors or who has the best resources that are outside, let's say, the School of Architecture as well. But four-year programs are so different from each other. Like the state schools in the United States tend to teach the most architecture. And then schools like the um, liberal arts colleges, like Harvard, Princeton, Yale, um, uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, Columbia, um, and MIT, we, we're asking our students to do all of these other types of classes in addition to architecture. So by the time they graduate, they're not locked into any one career or any one graduate program that they might want to pursue. And that's why they end up doing so many different things. Does anybody want to jump in? Um, but I, I have more questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, well, maybe I have one one question. I don't know if you have discussed this in your presentation, but I just wonder. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, according to your description about the. I mean the the well, let's say the the program in at, at the MIT, which uh, allows students to be whatever they want. Uh, let's let's put it that way. I just I just wondering whether I mean uh, when the students uh, uh, try to to get admitted to MIT, what's actually their expectation? Because mostly in general, when you know when students try to enter one well, one school of architecture there they, well i mean the be the basic assumption is they want to be an architect right but i mean like but considering like this program which is very kind of liberal they can do whatever they want just wonder actually what i mean whether you have you know run kind of survey to the students just one wondering what what is actually their you know what what they have in mind when they're you know want to join mit for uh, to learn architecture yeah well for sure, I think there definitely are students, high school students who apply to MIT where they're coming specifically for, usually it's computer science, like by far the most popular major at MIT is computer science, like half of the, every class is going to computer science immediately. The other half are not sure about what they might want to do. And then, and then of course, a lot of our architecture and design majors, they actually leave computer science and come to architecture and design. So they come later. Um, I can give you some like statistics. Like, so for instance, um, in a normal year, um, not including the COVID years because the numbers went crazy, but prior to the COVID years, like around 22,000 students apply to MIT each year. And of those 22,000, um, 1,300 or 1,300 are admitted and then 1,100 or 1,100 actually come each year. That's the size of each uh, undergraduate class. Of the 22,000 who applied, about 16% submitted a portfolio. Um, and the portfolio can be art and architecture, uh, maker, uh, performing arts, or research. Um, so, so, in that, so 16% doesn't sound like a lot, but 16% of 22,000 is actually a lot. And of course, if you have to review all of those high school yeah. art and architecture portfolios like me, um, it's a lot of portfolios. In fact, I can't even do them all. There's something like 800 or 1,000 maybe that come each year. And so we have to have multiple people reviewing these portfolios. But what you see primarily is like traditional high school art classes uh, dominates those portfolios. But then Every once in a while, you get some pretty amazing high school students who've done um, outrageous things, you know, um, you know, and uh, and those, of course, are the ones we write most positively about. But we can only when we review portfolios in architecture, we write our comments and we give them scores and we send that back to the admissions people. And but admissions decides on their own whether to admit those students or not. And so it's really tricky. Uh, we don't really know what we're going to receive each year uh, as far as the type of student, the talent of student, 
the quantity. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, Kamil, do you want to jump in? I think I, I see Kamil's raised hands. Is it, is it Hi, thanks for the uh, presentation. I, I think David sort of asked my question. <laughs> so so uh, it's all good. Thank you. Oh, it's about the motivation, right? Yeah. Because it, it, I find it kind of interesting when you said um, there is approximately, uh, I, I, I don't know if I get the number right, but 30% of, of students um, ended up becoming architects. Um, and uh, if I, I was wondering if that's, if that's something that's recurring every year that you notice that you who uh, served, um, and I was wondering if that is so. Yeah, what was what would be the motivation of actually going into the architecture school at MIT? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I think you would get a different answer from each of the students. Um, the like the the students who are going to graduate this year, for instance, um, one of one of our architecture majors, her motivation to come to MIT was to study physics. And she changed her mind after taking uh, that first design class, 4021. Um, another, I think the four of the other fifth year, fourth year students all came in thinking architecture was the thing they would want to study at MIT. Um, and in general, they're aware of the fact that there are five-year programs out there. Uh, but they pick a four-year program, I think, again, for the flexibility. Um, oddly enough, I have, I think, four students right now who were rejected by Cornell. Um, they applied to Cornell. They even went to Cornell's architecture summer camp and then applied to Cornell, did not get into Cornell, because at Cornell, you have to apply to both the, the university and the the architecture school. So these students were rejected by Cornell, but then accepted by MIT. So you can imagine they're very smart uh, students. And then I've always had them bring me their portfolios to show me and the portfolios are usually really good. So I don't know why Cornell rejects these students, but I'm happy they do because I like them. They're really good students. Um, but those are the few students who kind of are like really architecture only. The majority of the students who end up graduating with the group, with an architecture major did not think that's what they were going to do originally. They thought they were going to do something else. Um, and for some reason, they fell in love with architecture rather than um, whatever else they came for. Um, and the same is true of our design students. Like, um, I think we now have about... Um, of those, uh, of our design minors, more than half of them are double majors where they're majoring in something else, usually mechanical engineering or computer science, but then they're also majoring in design. And many of them started off just taking one design class um, and then just really enjoying it and then wanting to take more classes. Um, I don't know, did that answer the question in the way you wanted? I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, yes, because I uh, sorry, thank you. Sorry, sorry, Camille. Do you want to uh, respond to that? Oh no, no, because I think the discussion, like for instance, like here in Indonesia, is sometimes we kind of uh, assume that if students, you know, if they go to architecture school, then actually they need to be an architect. You know, it's somehow that's kind of a, a basic assumption, and then also. And uh, also there are students that uh, feel probably like that. If I, if I, you know, if I, in, a, in an architecture school, what they want, expect to have is actually like skills or even practical skills. So when they, they graduated, they, you know, they can just jump into the professional, you know, practices wherever they want. But I mean, right now, I think it's kind of uh, not that, uh, well, the situation in architecture education is not that simple anyway, because probably also the media, the technology, and, you know, I mean, that the, the things that we can learn that is related to architecture is so expanded. You know, like, like now in MIT, I think um, one of the 
based Western, like like you just mentioned, machine learning, you know, AI, and and all of these stuff. And this also, I mean, this this thing shape well so much possibilities that we can do about architecture. And on that sense, and I mean, on, well, I mean, in that sense, it's also kind of bring well, kind of a a very big discussion about what is architecture, what is a you know architecture practice in the future might be. So I don't know. I mean, like like uh, probably the question would be like, what is actually not probably not the best way. I mean, whether the the architecture education that we have right now that is always trying to kind of relate whether the you know. The, the knowledge in all the theoretical things and this course in at the school and the practices needs to be really connected. Yeah, or, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I'll tell one story. I, I tell this one because it, it always makes me, I think it, it tells a good story about the difference between MIT and IIT in Chicago where I taught. Um, one of my students, she had just, she was, she was only in her sec, first semester of second year. So she's not had any architecture classes yet. And she applied for a job over winter break. So at MIT, nobody goes to school in January. You can do anything you want during January. Some students like to get jobs for the month. So I saw this student, she ended up getting a job with the architecture firm Perkins and Will. And when she got that job, she beat out all the graduate students who applied for that job, who had a lot of architecture, right? And so yeah. when, when she came back at the end of January, I'm like, Catherine, come to my office. I want to talk to you about how you got that job. <laughs> and so she came to my office and I'm like, uh, how did you get that job with Perkins and Will? You don't even have a portfolio. You don't have, <laughs> like, you have no architecture experience. She said, well, she said, I used to do a little VR headset design work in high school. Uh, then when I came to MIT for one of my research opportunities, I did a virtual Museum of Fine Arts uh, VR headset tour. So there's the museum in Boston, it's called the Museum of Fine Arts. And she helped to put together like a tour of the museum that you could go on through this VR headset, right? So Wilkins and Will sees that on her resume, you know, VR headset, VR headset. And they said, hey, do you wanna come to Los Angeles and help us work on our VR headset? Uh, uh, because we're starting to use that more and more or virtual walkthroughs of our building. And she said, okay, I'll come do that. And off she went. And so I, I, that's to me like such an MIT story because like had she been trained as, as just an architect, it's possible she would not have been the best one and therefore she wouldn't have gotten that job. Yeah. But she happened to be the only one <laughs> who knew anything about VR headset design. Um, and, and that's just one example of many. She's also the first student where we have career fairs here at MIT like two or three times a year, and very few companies come that are architecture or design. But what I do is I look at all the companies, and then I, I, I show the students which ones have architects working for them, which ones have designers working for them, et cetera. And I say, go to the career fair and then try to get these kind of jobs from these guys. Mm -hmm. And so Catherine goes to the career fair. She ends up talking to this company that's a software company, and she ends up getting a job with them. And I'm like, Catherine, come to my office. <laughs> so she comes to my office. I'm like, how did you get that job? <laughs> and she goes, well, funny story. And, you know, they, they needed somebody who could do some coding, you know, but they have other coders that can do the, the more hardcore coding. But they also needed somebody who could make 3D drawings of building components in Rhino and then connect those to the code. And I'm like, and you can do that? She goes, yeah, I had enough computer science and enough <laughs> trying to put that together. And not, that's the company she works for today. She ended up working for them one summer. And then that became like a part-time job while she was in school. And then when she graduated, they kept her on um, as their kind of architect expert. And, and she has <laughs> very little architectural expertise, um, but that's just another example. Yeah. Very interesting. And this kind of story is kind of a general in, at the MIT? Yeah, I mean, I have so many. I mean, you can, <laughs> you know, it's just like the student who almost double majored in material science and architecture. The only reason she didn't double major 
is because she wanted to leave one semester early. Uh, and, and she's like, oh, it's okay if I don't get the double major. So she ended up leaving with two minors, one in computer science, one in material science. And then she asked me for a letter of recommendation for graduate school, and she was only applying to one school, the University of Texas at Austin. And I said, most of our students went to Harvard, Columbia, Yale, Princeton, et cetera. But we, I've never had anyone who wanted to apply to Texas. And I said, why do you want to go to Texas? And she said, two reasons. One, I'm tired of the cold. And two, um, University of Texas at Austin has the best material science architecture program in the world. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> but, um, and that's, so that's what she's doing now. She's not as interested in buildings as she is in the materials uh, that we are buildings out of. Uh, and, um, and, and so she's, she's yet another one of those students where um, just her dick, you know, where I walked out. You know, like we have a number of students that have gone on after MIT, they've either worked for a couple of years and then gone to like, usually Harvard's probably the most popular graduate uh, master's program. Um, but they'll often either do that, very few will do that right away when they graduate. Most will take some time to work and then go off to graduate school. Um, I think I have 18 letters of recommendation to write by January 2nd, you know, and those are all students who are, are going back to graduate school after having taken some time off. Um, Very interesting. Wow. Yeah, I, I think, Paul, um, I met Calvin Zong, who was, I think, in the MIT undergrad program. So when I was at WeWork, um, he was there and he was not doing like you know, I was doing architecture at WeWork and he was doing like their robotics fabrication. So um, that, that's like another example of how common it is to find an undergrad MIT student somewhat doing like still related to architecture, but kind of in the intersection of technology and maybe something a bit more niche. Yeah. Um, so I find it very interesting. Calvin's another one of those guys. Like Calvin, one, so he was studying, well, I, well, I don't want to get ahead in the story. He, he was an architecture major, but I think his, he had a second major, I want to say, in like either comparative media studies or art, art culture and technology. But in any event, one summer he, he got a job for a, a mechanical engineering firm. <laughs> and I'm like, Calvin, how did you get that job? You're, you're not a mechanical engineer. And he said, well, you know, I started in mechanical engineering at MIT or I took a class or two or whatever. Uh, but he said the reason they hired me is because I could speak mechanical engineering, but they also needed a designer. And so he was like the lead designer for this mechanical engineering company. And then like Diana said, you know, when he graduated, he ended up going to work with WeWork. And I think he developed a real interest in the machines that ultimately could build buildings for us, right? Whether you call those robots or 3D printers or whatever. Um, and I think that's really where he wanted to head uh, with WeWork. Of course, WeWork uh, didn't uh, stay in business in the way he needed it to to do that. But then when I was talking to him about graduate school, he was telling me that's what he was interested in looking into in graduate school. Uh, he's, he's back here at MIT now. Um, but I haven't had, I've only seen him twice and I haven't had a chance to really talk to him, partly because of COVID. Like his first year as a master's student, he was... Uh, attending virtually. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, Calvin's a perfect example of MIT. Calvin also taught a class called How to Make Almost Anything, which, which is a class really geared more towards engineers and even me lab people. But Calvin knew how to use all the tools and machines that that class taught uh, so that students could then design and make a product at the end. Uh, yeah, he's he kind of can do anything. Yeah, so maybe Dave... <laughs> But this is like a lot of students go in not because not not having maybe not necessarily having a clear idea of what they want to do, but maybe just it's more guided by curiosity and what the program can facilitate. Like if yeah. maybe since the MIT program can facilitate this interest between that's very obvious and probably MIT is all the place for this, you know, this students, right? This persons who have this, you know, this curiosity wants to try things and, 
and just want to learn and expand their knowledge and their skills you know well anyway times is up it's already well actually we already over like five five minutes from the time slot yeah. anyway thank you for your time paul is uh it's been a pleasure to have you here thank you diana dika and uh all the uh all of the fr all all friends that still who are still with us until this late hour i hope uh, yeah I, i hope everything that we in the discussion everything that, that the presentation from the yeah diana and paul i mean i'm pretty sure we can learn from those presentation for us thank you so much all right paul and uh, okay. thank you all for the opportunity thank you i know